there's definitely a lot of evidence out there to suggest that if you are more active on social media, particularly on Twitter, that it can boost your citation rates of papers, which will lead to you know, a further impact of what those papers are making, which will be beneficial when it comes to promotion time. Hey, Dr. Ken Dutton Register here from STEM Venturist. Today's video is gonna be a little bit different. So a couple of months ago, I got asked to give a keynote seminar at Durham University's um, Academic Development Career Office. They had an online seminar conference around the use of social media and how it can benefit academics. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different and take this keynote seminar and chop it up into a multi-part series talking about how social media can benefit you as an academic. Okay, so today's video is all about using Twitter as an academic or a PhD, and specifically how to use it effectively and what are some of the benefits that you can gain from using it regularly. So I mentioned LinkedIn, but why Twitter? Why should academics be on Twitter? Well, it really comes down to knowing what your purpose is, and I think Twitter can be used in a wide variety of different ways. Um, so just to be familiar with it, uh, Twitter, you've got about 280 characters. It's usually short form content. You can add photos and videos, um, and you can actually do the same for LinkedIn as well. But I find that Twitter seems to be a really great place to connect with other academics. So it's not just about you know posting your dinner meal or whatever, that, days, days of that have long gone. Um, academics are really embracing it through a variety of different reasons. And so one of them is, it's actually a really great source to be able to curate content. So by based on the people that you follow, um, you will get content based on what your interests are. And so I've definitely used this as a way to keep up to date with um, trends, really hot emerging papers, maybe ones that aren't in print, maybe they're on a, a, a preprint server such as BioArchive. Um, so it can be a really great way to sort of narrow, narrow down and, and get you the content that you want really quick. Um, maybe I'll mention here, if you are on Twitter, there was a bit of a, a kerfuffle about the new PubMed uh, format. So um, Twitter will help you out. You don't have to worry about it if you didn't like it. <laughs> um, but there's definitely people that will just go on there and just use it for that purpose. And this is sort of termed as lurking. And while you can totally do that, and a lot of people do do that, um, I think it's a wasted opportunity. You can definitely do a lot more. And the reason for that is the fact that it's a public domain. So in this example here, you know, maybe you're chatting with someone right next to you, you're eating some ice cream, but maybe you're talking about something that's happening in the lab. Everyone else, around the world are potentially listening in or can potentially find that conversation. And this means it can start new dialogues, not only with other scientists, but also members of the community. And this can really lead to a bunch of different opportunities that will benefit you and also the broader community. So more specifically, because you know, I know there's a lot of you know, uh, critics out there in terms of like, you know, is it worthwhile putting my time in there? Um, I keep getting told that all I need is papers. Well, there's definitely a lot of evidence out there to su suggest that if you are more active on social media, particularly on Twitter, that it can boost your citation rates of papers, which will lead to you know, a further impact of what those papers are making, which will be beneficial when it comes to promotion time. Furthermore, it can really increase your academic exposure. So um, there was this trend going around, I think a year or two years ago called Donut Your Thesis. And the idea was to try and uh, use donuts in imagery to explain what your thesis was about. And so I made this little quick figure here uh, trying to explain about the different genetic profiles of different melanomas, which is what my research is, um, in the formats of different donuts. So uh, skin having lots of mutations um, all the way to uveals, which have very no minimal mu mutations. And I link that to the different toppings on a donut. Um, I found out uh, about a month after I posted this that someone at a, a big, well-known international melanoma meeting during a keynote used it as part of their introduction, and they credited me with it. So, like, you know, that was a really great um, feedback to hear that, you know, basically the whole international melanoma community saw that uh, my figure and my, my name in that presentation. But I can also create a lot of opportunities, and so I was actually very hesitant and dragged my feet in joining Twitter. 
um, mainly because I, I couldn't think of a good handle or a tagline, um, which it turns out you can change any time, so I don't know what I was worried about. <laughs> um, but literally within, I think, two weeks of being on the platform, I saw someone calling out for speakers for Pint of Science, and I just sent them a quick message on Twitter, and you know, within a week, I was confirmed speaker, and I got to speak at that uh, science communication festival. So that was really within two weeks of being on the platform, having very minimal followers, um, and really not really engaging with the platform in a huge amount of detail. But I think there's a number of different other ways where it can benefit your academic career, and one of them is the the art of minimalism. So having 280 characters to, to write your thoughts and processes really makes you think about how concise you need to be. Um, and so I've found this has been incredibly useful in getting rid of all that gap filler content, um, which really has helped my um, paper writing as well as the grant writing, particularly the grant writing, because I think there's just this very easy temptation to put in a lot of words um, that just don't need to be there. And the more words you have in a grant application, um, the worse it is for the, the reviewer and the more chance you're going to get marked down. So if you can make things nice, concise, and clear, it's going to lead to better outcomes in your academic career. So Twitter, for that example, I think is really great in helping you improve that. Now, you can also uh, measure metrics. So if you are a metrics freak, um, there are different metrics out there that you can use to track how good you're going on Twitter, which is sort of a bit of a debate. But this one, for example, is the K index, so also known as the Kardashian index. So this is an index created, I think, back in 2012, maybe. I could be wrong on that. And the idea was to see, sort of like gauge person's Twitter following versus the number of uh, citations on papers that they've had. So basically measuring their social presence versus their academic presence. And so those that have more of a social media presence as compared to uh, academic presence, they are considered Kardashians of the science world. And there's a calculator, if you can go on this little link down here, um, you'll be able to find out what your K index if you've got a K index above five, you're considered a Kardashian. I think I'm currently sitting at about 3.8, so um, either I'm about to make a Kardashian or maybe I need to start working on my academic uh, profile a bit more to uh, stop becoming a Kardashian. Lastly, uh, if you don't, if you were, lastly, if you do want some really great content, I would recommend checking out uh, this resource. Um, it came out, I think, maybe three months ago. It's from Daniel Quintana, um, and it's a really comprehensive resource. It's a quick book, you know, it's probably like a 10, 15 minute read, but it tells you exactly how to use Twitter geared specifically for scientists and academics. Um, so I can't recommend looking at this more highly. Now, the problem is, is that, you know, when you sort of first jump on Twitter, there's this expectation is that, oh man, I'm in the, I'm in the internet. So, you know, I've got the whole audience in there. I'm going to fire out these tweets. I'm going to get this massive following. Uh, my papers are going to get cited through the roof. Um, but in reality, it's, you know, it's just probably talking to your mum and that one person in the lab who's got Twitter. Um, so what the comparison is, is really like, you know, if, if you've got a, a poster and you've put it in the, the Institute's uh, elevator, for example, um, and, you know, the traffic that you're getting through are just the people in that elevator at that Institute. But if you have a bunch of flyers there and you've made a compelling poster that people in the elevator will take that poster out and post it elsewhere. Um, that's sort of like how you can sort of begin to build an audience. And, and that's sort of like the comparison, I think, that maybe w might work or not work for you, I don't know, but let me know. <laughs> um, so the, the point is that you need to build an audience to really be effective. Um, there's nothing worse than sort of like starting out on Twitter and not really investing in the time to build an audience and just feel like you're talking to a blank wall. And I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, you can't just build an audience overnight. The comparison here would be thinking about, you know, once you've published a paper, how long does it take to get cited? It takes years. And the same thing happens with building social media audiences is that you need to do a little bit every day over a long period of time. It could be five minutes a day, that's all you need to do, but you still need to be consistent and you need to be constantly proactive on the platforms. And as I said before, this takes a lot of time. Hey, have you subscribed yet? Doing so is really valuable because it helps build the community and gets more career advice to more academics and more PhD students so it can help you achieve your career goals, whether that's inside or outside of academia. Let's get back into it. 
So the question that I typically get is, you know, how do I build an audience? You know, I mean, I want to be on Twitter, but I'm really not sure what to do. What, what do I, what do I communicate? What do I tweet about? And how do I sort of build this following? Well, the first thing is you, you need to know or unknow the algorithm. So the algorithm of these platforms work in a way that it shares content that is highly engaging and is getting a lot of interaction. So the more engaging the content that you can create, the more content that you can create new conversations, this is the stuff that's gonna help spread your tweets further and get more of an audience in front of it and hopefully build your following base. And so it's gonna, uh, so not surprisingly, it comes back to adding value. Always be adding value. So where do you start by building an audience? Well, first thing is you can just start following your immediate contacts. So this, whether that's your friends, your colleagues, your collaborators, uh, maybe it's people within your field. So for example, I'm a melanoma researcher, I'll just search melanoma and just add anyone who's doing melanoma research. You can take it up another level, you can start searching for cancer, um, or if you've got a certain uh, passion that you like. So for example, I really like science communication. I can start searching for scientists who are engaged in, sci in science, communication, science communication, or on Twitter it's referred to as um, SciCon. Um, and so I really recommend trying to build an audience first around a scientific audience because these are the ones that are going to probably follow you and it's a lot easier to sort of start interacting initially, um, particularly if you haven't really done a lot of psych on before or talking to the general public. Now you can also build an audience by explaining your work um, and so you can start talking about the papers that you're publishing, maybe ones that you're about to publish um, as long as that's okay. Um, or you can explain the work of others. So maybe you've just seen a really great paper, you absolutely loved it and you couldn't put it down, and now you can do a quick breakdown of you know, why you found it interesting. Um, as, as a melanoma researcher I know, he um, posts what he's reading every now and then, and I, I find it fascinating because he's, he's, he's quite an engaging researcher. Um, shout out to Hunter Shane. Um, and I just like to see what he reads. So, I don't know, you'll be surprised. Now if you're promoting your papers or promoting another study, you don't want to just go, I just published my paper, here's the link. Uh, it's incredibly boring and it's likely that no one's going to engage with it, there's no picture associated with it. So instead what you want to do is do something called a tweetorial. Now the idea here is you, you talk about that what you found, so you do a quick little first tweet to hook everyone in, you provide the link, and then you say that you've got a thread explaining what you did and what you found. And you can use this terminology of one slash n, which means the first tweet of a series of tweets. And basically you can go through, talk about how the project came about, you can highlight key findings in the paper. You only need to do like maybe nine to 10 tweets, but this is something that really engages people, increases your chances of your tweet being shared. Now you can also live tweet a conference. Uh, for example, you could be live tweeting this right now. Um, so a lot of people you know, in a pre-COVID world um, couldn't make it to certain live events or conferences. And so I would often tune in if I couldn't make it, because you know I am based in Australia and it's hard to get to some of these high profile uh, conferences. Um, I would tune in, just follow the hashtags of that conference and I could sort of find it. And I always added the people that were constantly engaged on that platform. And I've found that by live tweeting a conference, so I've, I've live tweeted the American Association for Cancer Research Annual Meeting, that you know I can easily get 30 to 50 followers over that time period of a week. Um, so doing that adds value. Um, you can also be tweeting about uh, social events, for example. So this is a, a quick picture of when we were at one of the AECR meetings where we did a, a pub crawl, essentially. Um, that's in front of the Chicago Bean, and it was freezing cold. Oh my God, it was so cold that night. <laughs> Um, but you can also make observations or seek advice. So maybe you see something in academia that you don't agree with. Um, maybe you have a problem that you're trying to deal with and you can sort of ask academic chatter or PhD chat. Um, these are hashtags that people use to sort of talk about their problems with academia to crowdsource ideas and how to resolve them. And this can be another way to build audiences. And lastly, you can just show some personality. It's, it's recommended that you have at least 10% of your tweets showing some type of personality. Um, so you wanna become across as a human. It is social media, it's not just pure um, academic. So you know, have some fun with it. So the next question is, is how many followers should I have? 
And that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, there have been some research suggesting that you know maybe a thousand followers is the ideal optimum amount, mainly because in this study, I think they looked at different scientists on um, Twitter and they looked at how many followers they had and how much reach did they get into the general community and media platforms. And so most academics sort of be f are following other academics. There's very few that are just purely targeting a, a general community audience. But in this approach, um, they showed that you know once you reach a thousand followers, that's sort of like the ceiling cap of reaching the maximum number of sort of peripheral community and media outlets. Um, and if you go above that, that's good, but it's not really adding extra percentage on top of that. So that being said, um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, size isn't important. What is important is engagement of your following base. So if you can create um, a small following of highly engaged um, followers, that's way better than a super large number of people who never like your tweets because the algorithm likes engagement. So small number of followers, high engagement is gonna get your tweets further and eventually increase your following over time. Now again, I just wanna like emphasize one more point. It, it, you don't really have to invest you know, years before you can get value out of being on Twitter or social media. Um, so for example, my wife, she's doing her PhD in echidna research. Um, she's sort of set up a Twitter account late last year. She hasn't really been super active on it. Um, maybe probably done 20 to 30 posts over four or five months. Uh, maybe had about 30 followers. And then last week she just posted this picture um, talking about what she does with echidna research. And it exploded, it had like 180 likes and she gained like 60 followers um, just from that one tweet alone, which is more than I've ever had. <laughs> so like, it's just surprising, like you don't know what's gonna blow up and you really don't have to be long on the platform with that engaged to actually get some following. Lastly, there are opportunities you can make. So again, when I talked about when I first joined Twitter, um, one of the things that I had was the opportunity to be on a podcast. Um, I found someone's tweet saying that they do a local community radio station and did they have any scientists out there that would be willing to talk on the, po on the podcast. I signed up, I was literally two weeks on the platform and then I did a 40 minute um, podcast uh, that was streamed locally, which I think was really fantastic and a great experience. So there are opportunities that you can make yourself with social media and all of these will have an impact on improving your academic record. Hopefully you enjoyed today's video. As always, if you enjoyed the content and you find it valuable, please subscribe to the channel or like this video. This will help tell the algorithms that this content is valuable and spread it further and wider and will help more scientists and academics get the advice to achieve their career goals, whether that's inside or outside of academia. As always, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And if you want more of the other videos associated with this, video series, make sure to follow these links. Catch you next time.